Good morning. I'm excited to share God's Word with you today. It's actually going to be part three of a sermon series I began a couple weeks ago on when we go to church. You know, years ago I took my wife and three kids water skiing at the lake. Before we got around that day, early in the morning, I grabbed a spare gas tank and headed off to Quick Trip to get it refilled. When I returned home, my wife was kind of on to me about putting the gas can back in the boat. I blew her off and told her I'd do it later. Well, later on that afternoon, we got around to going to the lake. It was a beautiful day, and, and we enjoyed uh, water skiing that afternoon. Before we went home, the water was getting real calm, like glass. I decided that I would take one more run on the slalom. So I got behind the boat, and my wife pulled me up out of the water, and I probably wasn't up more than a minute or so when the boat shut down. My wife was turned around trying to figure out what was wrong, and I just holler out, it's out of gas. Hook up the other tank. Well, you should have seen the look on her face when she saw that the spare gas tank was not in the boat. And there I was, sitting on the end of that rope in the water like a sitting duck. I'm just glad she didn't have a shotgun that day. I think she could have killed me. Luckily, there was a man passing by in, the, in a boat with some kids. And so I flagged him down, and he was gracious enough to take me to the marina to get some gas. We filled up the tank. We're headed back to the, to the boat. And he begins to share with me his testimony. He had a rough background. In fact, he was in prison when he began reading the Gospels out of the New Testament. And reading the story of Jesus, he said, I saw the Lord. His life was dramatically changed. At the time that I met him there on the lake, he was serving as an evangelist in the state of Missouri. He had seen the Lord, and now he was serving the Lord. God can reveal himself to anyone at any time, in any place, even in a prison cell. But you know the one place in all creation where God manifests His glory in a very special, unique way is in His church, as His people are gathered together to worship Him and to praise Him. In the previous two messages, we have learned from Isaiah chapter 6 that when we go to church, we see God, we see ourselves, and today we're going to discover that we see our service. I want you to see two things from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8 through 13. First, the call of God, and then secondly, the commission of God. First, the call of God. We see that in verse 8. God calls us to a relationship and into fellowship with himself. This relationship with God also involves a partnership. We are co-laborers, with Christ Jesus. By His grace, the Lord is willing to use us to accomplish His work here on earth. In the temple, Isaiah becomes aware of the great need of salvation within the nation. He overheard God talking to Himself. John Calvin, the great reformer, said, God held a consultation with His eternal wisdom and his eternal power. That is with the Son and the Holy Spirit. Isaiah heard God inquiring, Who shall I send? And who will go for us? The Lord had sent the seraphim to touch Isaiah's lips with the burning coal. Angels are ministering spirits that are sent out to render service for God's elect. But when it comes to proclaiming the gospel... When it comes to preaching the word, God uses human lips. The question that God gives provides an opportunity for someone to step up to the plate and to volunteer. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? There were numerous prophets and priests within the nation. And yet out of the whole nation, not one man stands up to undertake the task. Isaiah, on the other hand, doesn't hesitate. He jumps at the opportunity. 
lest anyone else should be chosen ahead of him. Here I am, he says, send me. A moment ago, as you recall, Isaiah saw himself as being undone and unworthy to be a spokesman for God. Now, having been a recipient of God's grace and being reassured of God's forgiveness, he is ready to serve the Lord. The Broadman Commentary says he was so overwhelmed with a sense of gratitude that he was willing to place himself completely in the hands of God. God had taken care of his past. He could have his future. A burning coal had touched his lips and taken away his iniquity. Isaiah was eternally thankful for what God had done for him. And now he is zealous for God. He has a, a heart that's burning, that's on fire for God. He has died to himself. He has been emptied of self. As Warren Wiersbe says, the prophet is no longer wrapped up in his own needs. He wants to do the will of God. Isaiah doesn't even know what he's signing up for. He doesn't even know the nature of the mission. He simply makes himself available to God. So many people make excuses when God calls, citing their lack of ability. You remember Moses. When God called Moses, Moses said, I've never been eloquent. I'm slow of speech. I'm slow of tongue. Jeremiah did the same thing. Jeremiah said, I, I don't know how to speak because I'm a youth. But as someone once said, God is looking not for ability, but for availability. God is searching for someone whose heart is wholly his and who is willing to go wherever he sends and to do whatever he asks. God is still calling believers today. With the vast lostness and the widespread brokenness of our world, the need has never been greater or more urgent. We should readily and joyfully undertake any task, no matter how difficult it might be. Here I am. Send me. See, God has taken care of your past. The question is, can he have your future? Are you willing to go to work? To be a witness for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Secondly, notice the commission of God. Isaiah volunteers and God commissions him. Isaiah says, send me, and God says in verse 8 or verse 9, go and tell this people. Klaus Westerman expressed it well when he said, Isaiah is sent. For this is not an event between God and the soul, but between God and his people, and therefore between God and the world. The holiness of God is not there just for God. And the purification of man is not there just for the bliss of man. But in order that something, as a result of this encounter, might go forth into the world. And then he makes this statement. There is no genuine encounter with God without this third aspect. Without this sending of others. When we go to church, we see God. We see ourselves. And we see our service. Isaiah was sent, and so are we. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We call that the great commission that God has given, that Christ has given to his disciples. The commission of God has never been easy. God forewarns Isaiah that his obedience will be met with obstinacy, opposition. His preaching will produce little effect. Isaiah is on fire for God. He is zealous for the Lord. He is willing to die for the cause. He thinks he's going to win the world. And God's just telling him, Isaiah, pump your brakes a little. Because this is not going to be an easy assignment. 
In fact, he says in verse 9 there, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. He's basically letting Isaiah know up front that his ministry will be fruitless. God doesn't want us to fail because of false expectations. Faithfully serving God is difficult and even dangerous. And when it comes to the commission of God, things really haven't changed all that much. In the New Testament, Jesus, Matthew chapter 10, was commissioning the apostles. And Jesus said, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. And children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who shall be saved. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you that you will not finish going throughout the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. Jesus forewarned the apostles that they had a hard road ahead of them. You see, following Jesus and being a faithful witness has never been easy. People that live in a prosperous nation aren't ready to hear or even in the mood to hear about sin and God's judgment. People who are prideful, they don't want to hear that salvation is by grace through faith and not by works. They think they can achieve or earn their way to heaven. People in this pluralistic culture don't want to hear that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and that nobody comes to the Father but through Him. Nevertheless, we must proclaim the gospel even if no one responds. We should not expect to win the world. We should expect the stubbornness and obstinacy of People. We should expect opposition and even persecution. But here's what we need to understand. Is that we cannot allow the stubbornness of people to be a stumbling block to our service. Even if nobody responds, will you still share the gospel? Even if you aren't appreciated or recognized, will you still go to work for the Lord? From a human standpoint, Isaiah was given mission impossible. Look at verse 10. Verse 10, it says, Render the hearts of this people insensitive or fat. It means to become hardened. Their ears dull, heavy. P people will be tired of, weary of listening. Their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and return and be healed. Sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? Sounds as if, as if God is purposefully, intentionally blinding, hardening, and condemning. Summers informs us that in all rabbinical use, the meaning is understand, understood as conditional, not intentional. If they see and turn, God will forgive them. Calvin even used the term accidental. It's not what the gospel is sent for. It's not what the word is sent for. But because of the nature of the people, the stubbornness, the rebelliousness, the word actually has the opposite effect upon their hearts. Thus the intended result is not to blind them or harden them or condemn them, but it is the inevitable result because of the stubbornness and rebellion of the people. God knows their hearts. John Calvin said the whole, the whole blame for this evil 
is laid on the people for rejecting the amazing kindness of God. If man is hardened by the word, he cannot blame God for the hardness of his heart. You know, the nature of the word, when we think about it, is to shed light. In fact, Psalm 1 19, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The nature of the word is to give light. The nature of the word is to give wisdom. The nature of the word is to soften our hearts and to break up the fallow ground within us. But you see, if we rebel, if we're stubborn, if we're stiff-necked, and we don't want to receive the word, and then... It has an opposite effect upon us. It produces a greater blindness and a greater hardening. Which explains why some people can sit under the preaching of the word of God week after week after week and be blind as a bat spiritually and have no ability to reason whatsoever. Dr. Weir, Warren Wearsby said, The sun that melts the ice also hardens the clay. We've been commissioned by God to proclaim the gospel regardless of how people respond. You may not win many converts, but keep on witnessing. You may not receive positive feedback or affirmation. Keep on sharing. Keep on serving. You, you may not achieve success in the world's eyes. Keep on working. See, as followers of Jesus Christ, we're to have no regrets. And we should not refrain from serving the Lord and being his spokesman. The Lord may be using us in ways that we are not even aware of. So let your worship, your witness, your work be for an audience of one. Do it first and foremost for God and God alone. Don't worry about numbers. Don't worry about results. I heard years ago a good definition of successful witnessing. It was simply this. Successful witnessing is witnessing in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. For the servant of God, it must be enough to be assured that our service is acceptable to God. It has to be enough. Otherwise, we become discouraged. We lose heart. We'll give up or give in. Even if the only result of our testimony is to leave people without an excuse before God, then so be it. We will labor faithfully to the glory of God. The end result of his ministry was not what Isaiah expected. He is startled and he's disturbed by this commission. He says, how long? Which, by the way, is a lament. It's an anguished cry of a troubled soul. How long, O oh God? And you see here that God responds. It's not, it's not real encouraging. He would have to endure this opposition, not for a year or two, but for 60 years. In fact, there's no time limit put on this. God says you are to do this until the nation is annihilated, until the nation is ruined. The vision of God on the throne is the only thing that keeps him going. Because he knows that God is in control and he will not get discouraged. That's what keeps him in the saddle. That's what keeps him in the game is to know that God is on the throne and that God is in control. He has to walk by faith, not by sight. He has to trust the Lord, even if he can't see what God is doing. He must be obedient and faithful. You'll see here that the Lord's commission is not completely hopeless. God would use Isaiah to raise up a remnant who would respond. 
God says that the nation is going to fall, but there will be a purified remnant that he uses to rebuild. As a felled tree retains life in its stump, and it begins to grow again, even so the fallen nation would give birth to a purified remnant who would carry out the purpose of God. Some will believe and be saved. So for the sake of the elect, endure hardship and never give up. Do it not for the masses. Do it for the few. Do it for this one. Do it for that one. Do it for the little boy or the little girl in your Sunday school class or the family down the street. Listen, you may not win the world. You may not change the culture. But you can make a difference in the life of one. Sometimes we think to ourselves, well, it doesn't really matter. No, nobody listens to what I say. My, my testimony really doesn't have an impact upon other people's lives. It really doesn't matter. We look at the masses and, and we say it doesn't matter. But let me ask you, does it matter to that one boy or girl? Does it matter to that one co-worker? Does it matter to that one neighbor, that one family? I think it does matter. I think that they will be grateful for all eternity for the fact that you are willing to be a witness, that you are willing to serve. Will someone answer the call? See, God is still calling. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? God is calling some to be pastors, full-time vocational ministers. God's calling some to go to the mission field. God's calling some to teach a Bible study or have a, a Bible study in their home or to teach a Sunday school class. But the truth is that God is calling all of us all of us, to be a witness. The book Lords of the Earth by Don Richardson tells the story of Stan Dale, who was a, minister, a missionary in Dutch New Guinea. Stan labored for over 15 years in Dutch New Guinea, and he saw very few people come to know Jesus Christ. In fact, the Yalu tribesmen killed him. They later became believers. And today there are many churches in that area. If Stan were to look at his life there right before he went home to be with the Lord, he would say it was fruitless. He might say it, it didn't matter a whole lot. That his service didn't count. But I want you to know from, from heaven's perspective, he now sees clearer than he ever did. And I can promise you he has no regrets. He'd do it all over again. He'd answer that call all over again to go and to be that missionary for God. You see, when Isaiah left the temple that day, he had seen the Lord. He had seen himself and he had seen his service. As Warren Wearsby said, he was no longer a mourner weeping for the loss of the king. He was a missionary. He was no longer a spectator, but a participant. See, I, Isaiah knew that the Lord was on the throne, that God was in control. He was assured, he was certain that God had called him and commissioned him. And the same grace that purified his lips would be the grace that would enable him to persevere no matter how difficult the task might be. And so today, as you hear God question, God's inquiry, whom shall I send? Who will go? I pray that all of us will joyfully, promptly step up to the plate and say, here am I, send me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace. God, that you have reached down and touched our lives and that we are not the same. God, you have taken away our sins. And God, you have purified our hearts and our lives. And Lord, that you're willing to use us 
to accomplish your work. Father, I pray that that we would make ourselves available to you. That we would not make excuses. But God, that we would, in obedience, by faith, volunteer to do whatever you need to be done. And God, we know that the same grace that saved us is the same grace that will help us to serve you no matter how difficult the task. God, we praise you for the opportunity. May we make the most of it. May we serve for an audience of one and for the glory of God. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for listening today, and I pray that God blesses you and keeps you as you go out to serve the Lord in your life. Have a good day.